Well, greetings, yogis. I'm here today with Ariel Foster. I'm delighted to have you on the show today, Ariel. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm glad, and you're you're very welcome. So these little yoga teacher grad school snippets are about offering uh, insight or career advice to new or to struggling teachers. But the way that I like to get into it is to, you know, hear a little bit about your journey, uh, what you do, and how you've come to the place where, to, to whatever extent, you feel that you're succeeding and finding fulfillment and being of service in terms of how you share yoga. Well, I started practicing yoga as a preteen and a teen. So I had a lot of exposure to yoga growing up. My grandmother was a yoga teacher. I had access to yoga for PE credit in high school. And I had a really good uh, close music teacher who was also a yoga teacher. So I got a lot of influences growing up. And I started teaching yoga fresh out of college and loved it. I was a student of the Kripalu tradition and I spent some time at the Kripalu Center. And I just simply like really, really fell in love with it. It came, uh, I sort of fell into that as a career, at least as a moon lighting career for a while. And then after about five years of teaching, maybe four years of teaching, I hurt my shoulder pretty badly. And I went to see a physical therapist who was able to make me feel a lot better in less than 30 minutes. And then I just kind of got obsessed with that idea of becoming a physical therapist. And I went on to go to physical therapy school and get my doctorate. And so I have been, I mean, that's a long process, but I've been um, interweaving yoga and physical therapy for a number of years. Wow. Fascinating. And so I'm curious about the shoulder injury and how long you may have been sort of suffering from that before you walked into that physical therapy office. I wasn't suffering for that long. What happened was I was in a a fairly Iyengar-based, alignment-based class, and I was holding down dog for a long time. And because I was kind of a, like, poor nonprofit worker in my early 20s or mid-20s at that time, I was just taking whatever classes I could could for free. Uh, so I was taking a class at the gym where I also um, I also taught. But at this time, the caliber of teachers there, I mean, one of my coworkers was on the cover of Yoga Journal that year that I taught at this particular gym. So the caliber of teachers was very, very high. Mm. Um, but I still hurt my shoulder. Mm. And it was a big conundrum. So I think what happened was I... Um, got a rotator cuff uh, tear of some sort mm-hmm. during that during that session. There was probably some precursors that set me up for that, mm-hmm. um, including a bike accident, including a couple of other other things. But yeah, the vinyasa on top of that mm-hmm. was probably what, what did it. But specifically holding down dog for a long time, I remember being in it and being like, I want to get out mm-hmm. and not listening to my own inner agency at that moment. Mm-hmm. And um, the next day not being able to lift my arm. Wow. Yeah. So so it's it sounds like there's a there's a moment that you remember that you sort of identify as the tipping point where okay now I'm injured and this is what I was just doing beforehand, but maybe there were there were several things prior to that that made your shoulder vulnerable. Uh, and then something about that moment, the the length of that hold, the repetitive uh, strain that you were experiencing over time set you up, yeah? I think so. I think it was a repetitive stress injury. And I also will attribute it to the cue, keep your shoulders back and down. When your arms are overhead, you should absolutely not be keeping your shoulder blades back and down. There's yeah. just no science behind that. There's no, it's nonsense, anatomically speaking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so I'm hearing sort of this this journey of, of starting teaching pretty young, uh, mm-hmm. being, being sort of passionate and idealistic about yoga, as, as I think we all are when we start. And then through your own experience, coming up against uh, an injury and, and looking at, okay, first of all, how, how do I feel better? How do I heal this injury? And then it sounds like because of your temperament, how do I understand why this happened and how maybe not to do this to others? And how do I yeah. broaden my, my knowledge base and deepen my understanding? And so physical therapy was a really good fit for you. 
Yeah, that's a pretty extreme response to getting your doctor in physical therapy is a pretty extreme response to having a having a boo-boo. Um, but for whatever reason, it worked for me. And I think it, I think right now, so you were, you were curious at one point what's going on in my career right now. I feel like people are really interested in what I do. In general, I, I am at a relatively comfortable point in my teaching and, and I, I mostly teach yoga anatomy now. I work as a physical therapist as well, and uh, I'm getting a ton of people just organically interested in what I'm doing, both private students, um, other yoga teachers, and I run a website called yogaanatomyacademy.com, and there's also a mentorship with that, and I've just been so pleased with like fairly minimal marketing how many lovely souls have come through that program with me. So... But like I tell you, 10 years ago when all of this was going down or 11 years ago when all of this was going down, none of this was on my agenda. Like wow. I didn't I didn't really know where this was going. Yeah. And I I will say that for people listening who think like, oh, well, I want that. I mean, I absolutely support whatever anyone's decision is. But um, but what I have had to do is I've had to take two really disparate worlds. The world of physical therapy is still embedded in this very traditional medical model mm -hmm. and the world of yoga is kind of all over the place. So, um, piecing these two worlds together mm -hmm. and making sense of it is mm -hmm. something I'm still very much in the process of doing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, so I, I would don't, go the ahead. thing is I don't recommend, <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend just like going to physical therapy school. Don't do what I have done. It, it's not so easy. It's, it's its own thing. It's, yeah. it's absolutely its own career. And you've got to be dedicated to that mm -hmm. as well to mm -hmm. be good at it, not just do it to support your yoga, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know that anybody would do that, but just in case somebody was listening. And yes, <laughs> maybe I'll just do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely hear what you're saying, Ariel. It's, it's a word to the wise. Um, yeah. It's interesting, though, because I hear, I hear two things that, that kind of pop out at me that I think are, are really sort of insightful or, or just useful to bear in mind for new or for struggling teachers, which is that I heard you say, you know, 10 years ago, none of this was, was really on the agenda for you. And, and I, would, I, would, I would extrapolate from that, that 10 years ago, the yoga landscape was quite different. And I feel like, oh my gosh, yeah. right. And that, and that mm -hmm. asana practice in the U.S., you know, has really started to take off 30 years ago. 25 years ago and and has been building steam since then and I think we're, we're very young in our own kind of uh, evolutionary process around how we practice how we teach mm -hmm. how we think about yoga and and I feel like every couple years there are new angles some of those angles come from physical therapy and Pilates and, and biomechanical research and, and a deeper understanding of anatomy some of them come from psychology and looking at trauma. Mm -hmm. Some of it comes from a sociopolitical perspective and saying, hey, how do we teach yoga in a way that's inclusive and that doesn't perpetuate yeah. various kinds of oppressive nar narratives or authoritarian structures? So there, there's a lot going on and I think it's really, it's really beautiful and it's really exciting. And yeah. I, I feel like very often new teachers have this kind of perspective or, or this perception that you have to teach a certain way and whatever the received kind of perspective on things is that they've received from their teacher training it's like well you know this is what you have to do you have to you have to teach these sequences and you have to use this language and this is the, very often it's like this naive position that this is the true tradition we're teaching the real yoga even though like mm -hmm. 10 other schools say the same thing and they're teaching something different right and in order to succeed I have to just do the general kind of thing that everyone recognizes as an asana class and I, I would counter that by saying, don't be afraid to discover what your particular passion and gift is in terms of how you share yoga and how your own journey is unfolding. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like you're a, you're a wonderful example of that. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 so when I first was exposed to yoga, a lot of it was like integral yoga, Shivananda influence, Hatha yoga. And then later on, I think what, what I became really passionate about 
um, two, two kind of veins in the yoga tradition. One was vinyasa and the other was Kripalu. Kripalu, for those who don't know, is a style. It's not a very dogmatic style, but it's, um, it's a relatively gentle style where you might you know, have a whole class on the floor if it were a gentle or moderate class. And there's a lot of room for wiggle room as a student to explore what your body is needing or what your heart space is needing at that time. Mm-hmm. So I had these these really lovely influences. Um, but then, you know, there was a part of me that sought out more alignment than what Kripalu offered that I felt like, well, Kripalu is really missing on alignment, even though I did my 200 hour teacher training there. And then vinyasa was a little bit fast. And I always felt pressure to teach these like, you know, really fast paced classes, which wasn't in my own practice truly. And, um, and then, you know, and then it became like the wave in DC, at least we had a big wave of rocket yoga being the, the trend. And what is that? Now it's rocket yoga is a, a lovely style created by a gentleman named, well, actually not created, uh, created by someone named Larry and I forget his last name, mm. but um, David Kyle has been uh, teaching it a lot. It's, it's like Ashtanga with fun stuff in the first primary series, like heads handstands and forearm stands and things like that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so that became a big trend where I live and Dharma yoga. Anyway, it, it doesn't matter, but it goes on. I think that the most authentic place that any of us can teach from, which is what you're getting at is to have some sort of background, some sort of exposure to whatever it is, and then to build from that. And there's parallels in like whatever profession you get into. So for physical therapy, you can study Maitland approach. You can study John Barnes, myofascial release. You can study um, all these different types of hands-on techniques or become a strength and conditioning coach, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if you are in the position of a physical therapist, because you're, you're not in this position as a yoga teacher, but it, as a physical therapist, if you're in this position of having the responsibility to um, help somebody make, optimize their health, improve their health, and get out of pain, then you're going to use whatever tool is in your toolbox. Mm-hmm. And there's no shame around it in physical mm-hmm. therapy, but sometimes mm-hmm. in the yoga world, there's this baggage of shame that you're not... Yes linear in one tradition that you're Uh not dedicated that you don't have this guru Mm -hmm. and that i think is a big disservice Mm -hmm. to us as teachers and it's a big to our own uh inner intelligence and it's a big disservice to our students Mm -hmm. and that's where some of the kind of conflict comes out these days i believe Mm -hmm. that's so interesting i mean I, i hear you sort of pointing or gesturing towards uh a way in which in in other fields like physical therapy there's there's a lot more acceptance of diversity of perspective and that different tools will work for for different issues and that this particular technique may have or, or this particular way of looking at the body might be really useful in these circumstances and then hey maybe you, you switch to this other technique or, or this you're addressing a different level of whatever's going on with the person through some other approach and that very often, I think the way that we have held yoga for some time, that hopefully is, is softening a little bit, is that it's, it's kind of sectarian. There's a sense that, you know, I belong to this tradition, we believe these things. Um, and, and I think often it's because the, the information may not have an evidence-based source that there can be some defensiveness around, no, this is what the authority figure told me, this is what's been handed down through the lineage, and so this is how we do it, and those people are doing it incorrectly. Like, this, this is an extreme mm-hmm. expression of it, but I've, I've been around that a lot. You know, I, I started teaching yoga in the 90s, and I worked at Anna Forrest's studio that was literally across the street, and well, actually it was on the same side of the street, but, but down the block. Uh, so like a block and a half away from the first yoga works, or actually it was the second yoga works because it was the one in Santa Monica. Nonetheless, we were that close to one another and it was like the Hatfields and the McCoys. I mean, there was a feud between these two communities and, and there was no intermingling. You didn't take classes there if you took classes here and vice versa. And there was a fair amount of conversation about how 
these are the reasons why what they're doing over there is wrong. And that is hilarious. Uh, yeah. And, and it was so glad to see that change over time. You know, I feel like once we, once we got to around 2003, 2004, there was a lot more of teachers who had taken different teacher trainings under different like charismatic guru figures starting to connect with one another mm-hmm. and say, hey, what do you do? How do you think about this? Oh, we learned it this way. Interesting that you do it that way. What has your experience been with that? If you hold the shoulder or the neck or the low back or the knee or whatever it is in this particular way, uh, you know, what, what's happened? You know, and, and how, maybe I'll try what you're doing. And that, that I thought was really, really beautiful um, to the extent that it's, that it's continuing to happen. I'm hopeful that that'll keep happening with other disciplines as well, you know, where there's a, mm-hmm. there's a sense that there's no shame in drawing on the knowledge base of this unfolding human experiment in embodiment, right? That no, no one has the, the holy grail. We're all putting the pieces together. So, so well articulated. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I see that as the, the future of yoga. And so if I were to offer any tidbits to newer teachers mm-hmm. or to teachers who are really struggling, would just be like, find whatever it is that lights you up mm-hmm. and go with it and mm-hmm. know that it might change. And that's OK. Um, I Mine has certainly changed over the years. So beautiful. That's totally fine. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I know you had uh, you had something that you were excited to share with my yoga teacher grad school folks. You want to tell us about that? Well, I have three things that oh, I want to I want to give. So one, I'm going to give away, just give away a, um, a like an online course that I created that has a summary of all of my basic. I know it's relatively basic, but basic uh, um, how to how to build your business as a yoga teacher. So I created this online course for uh, after I was part of a 200 hour teacher training where like you know, a few weeks later, I start getting email after email after email, like, what do I do? How do I make my resume? How do I, um, how do I find a gig at a yoga studio? Mm. And it actually turned out to be not, it's not that hard to create some of these courses these days. So I created, I had already had quite a bit of experience doing it. So I created this online course and I will just give that away to anybody listening. That's at yogaanatomyacademy.com slash freedom. Okay. So yogaanatomyacademy.com slash freedom. But one of the things I say in that course, which I think I did relatively well when I was first a yoga teacher, is that if you are a brand new teacher or if you're feeling uh, nervous or insecure or if you want to try out new things, then my philosophy is in the beginning, say yes to everything. Mm. So somebody says, can you teach this class in my basement for um, for nursing home participants, mm-hmm. like, yes, just say yes. Can I teach, can you teach this class to these teenage girls in an after school program? Yes. Mm-hmm. And once you do that, once you have, um, experienced and seen enough bodies and, mm-hmm. and been in that environment, I mean, so if you get 10 people in class and you teach, uh, you know, 300 classes your first year, then that's 3,000 bodies more or less that you've seen for an hour each. And that's just a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And so from that point, once you have that experience, you can and you should say no. So at that point, you should be much more discerning about what you start to take on, start to notice like where your teachings are resonating, where people are coming back, where you feel good, where your time is being used efficiently. One of the things about being um, a yoga teacher in the sense of being a, a teacher of yoga classes these days is that it just takes time. It takes time to arrive at wherever you're teaching. It takes time to teach and it takes time to leave. And that's your that's the currency of your life, you know? So at some point you want to take that time and you want to leverage it. You want to make sure that you're being paid a relatively respectful mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. Uh, amount, and also that you're optimizing your time so that you're not running around all over the place, even though like I'm kind of an advocate for that for, yep. you know, you for six months or a year, yep. um, at least for people who don't have a lot of experience. Now, if you were, you know, a neuro 
science lecturer and you had been creating all si- all kinds of courses for all age groups for 20 years and then you got your yoga teacher training certificate mm-hmm. yeah you might not need to say yes to everything mm-hmm. but this is for the general yes. person who's gone through yoga teacher training that yeah that's just the way to rock it in my humble opinion mm-hmm. and you'll get more tidbits like that if you go to that website i said yoga anatomy academy.com slash freedom <laughs> great and how do they away. how do they get the course is the course all ready for free on the site or do they have to do an extra step to to get it for free i think you just enter your i i have to set up the website okay. still the page still but okay. you just it'll just have be like enter your email address and uh, you know, you can always unsubscribe Great. from the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please do if you don't want to receive those emails, just unsubscribe. And then it's just a copy and p- paste link from there. So Beautiful. yeah, that's that amazing. is such a, that is such a wonderful offer. And everything you were just saying is it's so concisely and I think insightfully uh, offered. Especially, I, I think, I think for brand new teachers, understanding that there there are phases to the career, right, and that in the beginning. Yes, make yourself available. Say yes to everything. Be on the sub list. You know, take 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 lots of opportunities to keep learning and growing and gaining experience and building relationships. I often say to, to teachers, this job is all about relationships. The more you can build relationships with the desk staff, with the studio owner, with the other teachers, with the students that you meet, with the community center that you go to, you know, wherever the different gigs are that you're taking, and hopefully they'll be they'll be diverse because you're making yourself available. Build those relationships until you get to the point where you feel more confident. You feel you have a lot of experience under your belt. You're starting to get a sense. You're discovering a sense of what types of students are a good fit for you, who you feel you can help, who appreciates what you have to offer so that you're actually being yourself. And then at that point, I hear you saying, okay, once you've earned it, uh, then you're actually in a position to start saying, hmm, maybe I won't take that gig, or maybe I'll, I'll try and move this time slot over here, or maybe... It's been a year or two now that I've been working without, you know, two full days off. Let me try and figure out how to carve that into my schedule now that I've opened up opportunities for myself through, you know, the the, the work and gaining the experience. Totally. Love it. Yeah. You know, I think that sometimes you hear, occasionally you hear these complaints, kvetching within the yoga community, mm-hmm. yoga teachers don't get paid enough, etc. Mm-hmm. And absolutely, if you sit down and you do the math and you live in an expensive city as I do, yep. uh, it is very difficult slash impossible to make a um, like a, a middle class uh, mm-hmm. living. You know, you if, if you are paid on the high end and you teach 15 classes a week where I live, you'll probably still be eligible for housing assistance in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Um, but all that being said, uh, you we are also extraordinarily fortunate to be able to start careers after just a 200 hour training or maybe a 500 hour training, Mm -hmm. which is so very different from almost every other career out there. Yeah. And that you can think of that first year as your kind of your graduate school, Mm -hmm. so to speak, Mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be. And for people who have been through a 500 hour training, Mm -hmm. like you'll never know enough. So there's never going to be enough, enough to, you know, information, so to speak. But the more you have your your experience, you'll it will shine. It will show through your teaching forever, and that can't be taken away. Yeah. Yeah. And Julian, is there still time to to go over one more thing sure. that I wanted whatever, to share? Whatever you'd like okay. to do, absolutely. And and then we'll we'll sign off on this one. Yeah. yeah. So something you said earlier really resonated with me. It was about how we're incorporating more and more evidence-based um, science into our like physical asana practice, also probably pranayama practice, etc. And I came up with, and we've also been talking about a couple other things that, that um, well, you'll see why it resonates. But I came up with this list of 10 principles of anatomy-informed yoga. Beautiful. And you could also call it 10 principles of, forgive me, this is going to sound a little arrogant, but common sense yoga. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, but, you know, I mean, there's historically, there haven't been a lot of common sense applied to yoga because it's been held up as this mystical thing. So th- my 10 principles, the first one is any yoga pose can harm, any yoga pose can heal. 
you could hurt yourself in Tadasana, right? Like if you have certain tendencies. Mm -hmm. The second, which you've already mentioned, is everybody is unique. And so we're out there as teachers, each of us are unique, and we each have something to give to this community of yoga and to the world. But also each of our students might need something a little different, not just might, but certainly need something a little different from each other. Um, and then critical thinking is critical. Like we have to show up with a willingness to question the teachings, but also question our own, like what we are teaching. Mm -hmm. So if I realize that I've been teaching down dog in this one way for a long time, and then it suddenly occurs to me that, you know, okay, you don't, you shouldn't be taking your shoulders away from your ears, then you've got to be able and willing to revise, to start to think critically. You can't know any everything at any given moment. Mm -hmm. um, so critical thinking is more important than memorization of anatomy. And I'm saying this as a yoga anatomy teacher, mm -hmm. that if you learn to ask the right questions, psh, that's the juice. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll go keep going through the list, but most yoga asana is quite specialized. And it's not necessarily like what we would call my profession functional movement. Mm -hmm. So are we serving the poses or are the poses serving us, right? That's a really important question that basically means if I am so rigid about where to place the back foot in warrior one, I'm losing this bigger picture that I'm truly here on my yoga mat to amplify and optimize my life, my well-being. Um, obvious statement, but flexibility is no good without strength. Mm -hmm. Our bodies need a huge variety of movement. And um, this is to say that uh, repetitive practice is not going to be serving us for the long run, at least on a physical level. Um, safe strength building comes from progressive loading. That's a much more complicated one to unpack okay. Okay. because with body weight, it's a lot more difficult than if you're in the gym. You would obviously start with the one pound, work your way to 10, work your way to 20, 30, 40, 100. But with our own body weight, that's not as easy. Mm -hmm. um, there's a phrase that I haven't heard as much recently, but I still hear sometimes and can be used a bit as a crutch for yoga teachers. And the phrase is listen to your body. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful phrase. We should all be paying attention to the physical sensation that's going on if we're in a physical practice. Um, but I wouldn't say it's an effective phrase for preventing injury, especially with repetitive stress injury. It's just not. Another thing that I think we lose sight of sometimes in the yoga world is the idea that we are not responsible for eliminating someone else's pain or injury, that it is not our responsibility to heal that. Even if you call yourself a yoga therapist, you have no license, you have no capacity to diagnose, you know, no training in, in that. Um, and I know that's probably a bit of a controversial statement, but coming from where I come from, I hope you can see mm -hmm. that that's going to be my firm opinion mm -hmm. that like no matter your background, you can't be diagnosing somebody with, with a uh, yoga therapy training mm -hmm. um, or as a yoga therapist, you can, if you're a physical therapist as well as a yoga therapist, but yeah, that's my, my thing. Yes. And then so readily, readily refer out. That's, that's that. Mm -hmm. And I'll save the last one. Jim. Did you have any, uh, the last one's a big gem, but um, did you have any reflections on any of those? Oh, I, I just think it's wonderful <laughs> that you're, you're sharing now, right at the end, this little mini workshop that has so, yeah. <laughs> that has so many good nuggets that I think uh, anyone who's, who's really captivated by what you're saying can dig deeper into. Yeah. These are, these are great principles and, and I, I'm looking forward to talking with you more about them. Yeah. yeah. And so then the, the last one is honor the science, that evidence-based um, evolution that's happening in the yoga asana world right now, and also honor the mystery, so to speak. Mm. Right? Yeah. Like, there are going to be people who claim, ex you know, extraordinary healing from sound bath or mm. um ritual or crystals or you know things that we can't really explain mm -hmm. and i the world i want to live in is a world in which we are valuing the evidence where it should be but we're not just using that as a dismissal mm -hmm. of other human beings in their experience mm -hmm. but we're also taking in um 
And it doesn't mean I, I'm going to be teaching, you know, and passing out crystals mm-hmm. and placing them on people's foreheads in Shavasana. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I, I, I'm going to teach what I love and what I'm attracted to. But I'm also going to be staying open to the mystery that I, not only me, but science cannot know everything. No one can. Mm-hmm. So if we ignore the fact that there is a lot of unknown Mm-hmm. then we're losing some of the really extraordinary beauty and history of this lineage that has come to us with all its different facets. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like very often people on, on both sides of that debate uh, miss something really key, which is that I think a scientific asset attitude is actually an attitude of being passionately engaged by the mystery, having a sense of awe, having a sense of wonder, uh, and yet not stopping the inquiry, not stopping at whatever the explanation is and just going, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to believe that, rather saying, well, okay, there's an experience, and that experience is powerful and meaningful and, and seems to have been beneficial in my life or in someone else's life. I wonder, I wonder how that functions. And very often I think people have this fear that if you if you look too carefully, you're going to lose the mystery. But my mm-hmm. experience, and I, and I would imagine your experience perhaps, and that of many other people I know who are passionate about science, is that the deeper you go into inquiring and understanding and, and looking for the evidence, uh, the more fascinating things become and the more you come up against things where you go, well, you know, we actually don't know. And I think that the, the attitude of being comfortable with not knowing is is actually uh, integral to to a science informed worldview, where I think very often uh, people on the more mystical side will say, "Oh no, science is arrogant, and they, they think they know everything." Um, hmm. I think I think the the opposite is true, and that the that that um, that sense of being really captivated by not knowing and being able to hang out in that space is as applicable to contemplative practice as it is to a, a kind of rigorous objective scientific attempt to find knowledge. Totally, totally, totally. Yeah. That's me pontificating philosophically. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, one of the ways that it shows up in my life a lot is that many times the simplest things help my patients, like really, mm-hmm. really simple things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what, someone who comes to mind right now is uh, a woman who ended up getting a knee replacement. And I didn't see her very much, maybe just one time after the knee replacement, might have even just been an email. But she told me that she felt better from the basic myofascial release that I did to her and I taught her how to do mm-hmm. to herself mm-hmm. before a knee replacement versus afterwards. Mm-hmm. Like she just gained so much benefit in so few sessions. Mm -hmm. And I've seen another woman who had tremendous headaches on the left side of her head. Mm -hmm. And when I gave her, I think it was a a right heel lift, uh, like her headaches went away by 95%. I mean, it was dramatic stuff. And um, not to discount the the study and experience that comes behind those treatments, Mm -hmm. but just to say that like, you know, I, I think that we are so captivated sometimes, overly captivated by the complex and mm-hmm. by the like gadgety mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. and the latest pharmaceutical that we miss really tremendous, simple um, healing opportunities, uh, of which yoga is one of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation unless we both had sort of this rich background of, of experience that, that, you know, became somewhat central to our lives. 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good. So wonderful talking to you. I, I, I think that uh, my yogis are going to get uh, some, a lot of benefit from what you're saying and, and hopefully also some good sort of thought provoking um, avenues to start to explore. Thank you so much, Ariel. Oh, it's such an honor. Thank you so much. And I hope we can connect more soon.